Hello, this is Learning English Pro. I'm Jer, your online tutor and guide. You're very welcome to my exclusive masterclass in medical English. I've merged my 15 most popular and informative English lessons on medical topics into one comprehensive masterclass. From doctor-patient dialogue to the specific jargon of surgeries and pharmaceuticals, this video is a goldmine for anyone eager to master the language of healthcare. I've designed this masterclass to sharpen your skills and deepen your understanding. Join me on this enlightening journey through the world of medical English. So if you're ready, let's get started on our English lesson on diseases and disorders. The first word on our list is asthma. Asthma is a chronic respiratory condition that causes difficulty in breathing due to narrowed airways and increased mucus production. Next up we have hypertension. Hypertension, also known as high blood pressure, is a condition where the force of blood against artery walls is consistently too high, increasing the risk of heart disease and stroke. Moving on, let's talk about diabetes. Diabetes is a metabolic disorder characterized by high blood sugar levels, often resulting from the body's inability to produce or use insulin effectively. Arthritis is another term on our list. It's used to describe various inflammatory joint diseases that cause pain, stiffness and swelling. Now let's learn about influenza or the flu. Influenza is a contagious respiratory illness caused by influenza viruses, presenting symptoms like fever, cough and body aches. Next word is depression. Depression is a mental health disorder characterized by persistent sadness, loss of interest and lack of energy. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurological disorder that affects memory and cognitive functions, primarily occurring in older individuals. Cancer refers to a group of diseases characterized by the uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells in the body. Another term is obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. OCD is a mental health condition where individuals experience recurring unwanted thoughts and engage in repetitive behaviours to alleviate anxiety. Now let's understand epilepsy. Epilepsy is a neurological disorder that causes recurrent seizures due to abnormal brain activity. Pneumonia is a serious respiratory infection that inflames the air sacs in one or both lungs, leading to coughing, fever and difficulty breathing. Next we have anemia. Anemia is a condition characterized by a deficiency of red blood cells or hemoglobin, resulting in fatigue and weakness. A migraine is a severe headache accompanied by sensitivity to light and sound. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that primarily affects the joints, causing inflammation and pain. Hepatitis refers to the inflammation of the liver, which can be caused by viral infections, alcohol, or certain medications. Atherosclerosis is a condition where plaque builds up inside the arteries, restricting blood flow and increasing the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder characterized by delusions, hallucinations and disordered thinking and behavior. Osteoporosis is a condition where bones become weak and brittle, increasing the risk of fractures. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition 
characterized by widespread musculoskeletal pain, fatigue, and tenderness in specific areas. Lastly, let's explore gastritis. Gastritis is the inflammation of the stomach lining, often causing stomach pain, nausea, and indigestion. I hope you enjoyed that lesson on diseases and disorders, some really important terminology there. Next up, we're going to move on to a lesson on English phrases you might use at a doctor's appointment. I need to make an appointment with the doctor, please. You can use this phrase to request a doctor's appointment politely and efficiently. Try it after me. I need to make an appointment with the doctor, please. Let's move on to our next phrase. I've been feeling unwell lately. This phrase is how you can express your general discomfort to the doctor clearly. I've been feeling unwell lately. I have a sore throat and a cough. With this phrase, you are describing your symptoms accurately to assist in diagnosis. I have a sore throat and a cough. I have a fever. This is what we would say in English if we have a higher than usual body temperature. Repeat after me. I have a fever. I twisted my ankle and it hurts. This is how we might explain to the doctor the cause of your pain and its location. I twisted my ankle and it hurts. I've had a headache for a few days. This is how you convey the duration of your headache for better evaluation. I've had a headache for a few days. I think I might have the flu. With this phrase, you can express your suspicions about your illness, prompting further investigation. I think I might have the flu. Let's move on to our next phrase. I need a prescription for my medication. This is how you request a prescription if it's necessary for your treatment. I need a prescription for my medication. Do I need to take any tests? This is how you might inquire about diagnostic tests that may be required. Do I need to take any tests? Is there a pharmacy nearby? With this phrase, we are asking about the availability of a nearby pharmacy for your prescription. Is there a pharmacy nearby? How much will this medication cost? This is how you inquire about the cost of prescribed medications or treatments. How much will this medication cost? Can you recommend any over-the-counter remedies? When we ask the doctor about over-the-counter remedies, we are asking for recommendations on non-prescription treatments for minor issues. Repeat after me. Can you recommend any over-the-counter remedies? What are the side effects of this medicine? We can use this phrase to learn how to ask about potential side effects of prescribed medications. What are the side effects of this medicine? When should I come back for a follow-up appointment? 
This phrase is for finding out how to schedule a follow-up appointment to monitor your progress. When should I come back for a follow-up appointment? Thank you for your help, doctor. And with our final phrase, we can express our gratitude to the doctor for their assistance. Thank you for your help, doctor. Hello, you're very welcome to this English vocabulary lesson on doctors. Let's dive right in and have a look at the lesson plan for today's video. So first up, what you need to know is that you'll be learning all about the different types of doctors and their names in English. And of course, this is Learning English Pro, so you'll be learning lots of essential vocabulary relating to each type of doctor. And with this key vocabulary comes essential context. Learn lots of history and important information about the different types of doctors you will learn in this lesson. So it promises to be a really exciting and interesting lesson for you today. So if you're ready, sit back, relax, and let's learn some English on doctors together. Our first type of doctor is a general practitioner. Now this is the British English general practitioner. It can also be shortened to just GP. GP. Now, this might be more commonly known as a family doctor or your local doctor. In American English, it is commonly referred to as a medical doctor. And this role can also be referred to in American English as a physician. So let's move on and have a look at some additional information and context for a physician or a GP. The area of medicine they work in is known as general medicine. And did you know the earliest documentation for a formal hospital with physicians that treated patients comes from the 5th century BC in Sri Lanka? Hippocrates, who lived from 460 to 377 BC, is commonly called the father of medicine. He is thought to be one of the first physicians to treat disease as being a result of natural rather than supernatural causes. And because of him, we have the Hippocratic Oath, which is an oath of ethics historically taken by physicians. In its original form, it requires a new physician to swear to uphold specific ethical standards. Okay, it's time to move on to our next type of doctor, which is a paediatrician. Repeat after me, paediatrician. So what does a paediatrician do? A paediatrician is a medical doctor who manages overall health for children from birth until age 18. And the area of medicine is called paediatric medicine. And the very first paediatric hospital was opened in Paris, France in 1802. Let's move on to our next type of doctor, a neurologist. Repeat after me, neurologist. Neurologists are specialists who treat diseases of the brain and spinal cord, peripheral nerves and muscles. And the field that a neurologist works in is called neurology. Neurologists treat serious conditions like stroke, Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis. Our next doctor type is a dermatologist. Repeat after me, dermatologist. And of course, a dermatologist works in the area of dermatology. A dermatologist is a doctor who specializes in conditions involving the skin, hair and nails. A dermatologist can identify and treat more than 3000 conditions. These conditions include eczema, psoriasis and skin cancer, among many others. Next up, we have anesthesiologist. This one's quite tricky. Anesthesiologist. Let's try it one more time. Anesthesiologist. 
An anesthesiologist works in the area of anesthetics. This provides treatments such as anesthesia, intensive care medicine, critical emergency medicine and pain medicine. Anesthesia is a state of controlled temporary loss of sensation or awareness that is induced for medical purposes. Our next medical doctor is a dentist. Repeat after me. Dentist. A dentist works in the area of dentistry. A dentist, also known as a dental surgeon, is a surgeon who specializes in dentistry, the diagnosis, prevention and treatment of diseases and conditions of the mouth. Have you ever thought about who the first dentist was? Heze Ra is the earliest dentist whose name is known to us. Around 2600 BC in ancient Egypt, he was known as the chief of dentists. Our next doctor type is an oncologist. Repeat after me, oncologist. An oncologist works in the area of oncology, but this is more commonly known as cancer treatment. These are doctors who treat cancer and provide medical care for a person diagnosed with cancer. In the area of oncology, there are three major areas, medical, surgical and radiation. An oncologist treats cancer using chemotherapy or other medications, such as immunotherapy. Let's move on to our next doctor type, a surgeon. Repeat after me surgeon. A surgeon works in the area of surgery and surgery is used to investigate or treat conditions such as disease or injury, to help improve bodily function, appearance or to repair unwanted ruptured areas. If we look back in history, surgery in different forms has been performed by humans for thousands of years. The earliest evidence comes from over eight and a half thousand years ago. Let's move on to our next doctor, which is a cardiologist. Repeat after me, cardiologist. A cardiologist works in the area of cardiology and they are doctors who diagnose, assess and treat patients with diseases and defects of the heart and blood vessels. Let's take a moment to talk about the human heart. The average heart is the size of a fist in an adult. Your heart will beat about 115,000 times each day. It also pumps about 2,000 gallons of blood every day as well. Our next type of doctor is a radiologist. Repeat after me, radiologist. A radiologist works in the area of radiology and they are medical doctors that specialize in diagnosing and treating injuries and diseases using medical imaging procedures. Let's take a look at the types of imaging procedures. There are x-rays, computed tomography, which is also called a CT scan, magnetic resonance imaging, also called an MRI, positron emission tomography, PET, or an ultrasound. Let's move on to our final doctor of this lesson, a psychiatrist. Repeat after me, psychiatrist. These doctors work in the area called psychiatry. A psychiatrist can diagnose and prescribe medication to treat a variety of complex mental illnesses, such as depression and bipolar disorder. In the area of psychiatry, a founding father of this medical field is Sigmund Freud. He was an Austrian neurologist and the founder of psychoanalysis, a clinical method for treating psychopathology through dialogue between a patient and a psychoanalyst. 
Today, we're delving into the dynamic field of emergency medicine. Whether you're a healthcare professional, a student, or simply interested in expanding your English vocabulary, you're in for an informative ride. So if you're ready, let's begin our English lesson. And we're going to start with the topic of today's lesson, emergency medicine. This is a medical speciality focused on the prompt assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of acute illnesses and injuries. Emergency physicians work in emergency departments to provide immediate care and stabilize patients in critical conditions. Our next term is triage. Repeat after me, triage. Triage is the process of quickly assessing and prioritizing patients based on the severity of their condition. It ensures that those with the most urgent needs receive immediate attention. Triage. Trauma refers to physical injuries resulting from accidents, falls or violence. Emergency medicine often deals with trauma cases that require rapid intervention. Repeat after me. Trauma. Resuscitation involves efforts to revive or restore normal bodily functions in a patient experiencing cardiac arrest, respiratory failure, or other life-threatening emergencies. Resuscitation. Related to the term resuscitation, we have defibrillation. This is the delivery of an electric shock to the heart to restore its normal rhythm. Automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, are commonly used in emergency situations. Defibrillation. We also have cardiopulmonary resuscitation, often called CPR. This is a life-saving technique that combines chest compressions and rescue breaths to maintain blood circulation and oxygenation in a person whose heart has stopped. Intubation involves inserting a tube into the airway to assist or secure the passage of air into the lungs. It is often performed in cases of respiratory distress. Repeat after me. Intubation. Our next term is epinephrine. Repeat after me. Epinephrine. This can also be known as adrenaline. It is a hormone and medication used in emergency situations to treat severe allergic reactions, also known as anaphylaxis, and cardiac arrest. Let's try it one more time. Epinephrine. Intravenous therapy, or IV therapy for short, involves giving fluids, medications, or blood products directly into a patient's veins, ensuring rapid absorption in emergency situations. So we have intravenous therapy, or the abbreviation is IV therapy. In the context of emergency medicine, shock is a life-threatening condition where insufficient blood flow to vital organs leads to cellular and organ dysfunction. Prompt intervention is crucial to prevent further complications. Shock. Our next term is hemorrhage. A hemorrhage is excessive bleeding and controlling it is a critical aspect of emergency medical care. Techniques like direct pressure and tourniquets may be used. Repeat after me, hemorrhage. A fracture is a break or crack in a bone. Emergency medicine addresses fractures with assessments, immobilization, and referral to specialized care. Fracture. Our next term is naloxone. 
This is a medication used to rapidly reverse opioid overdose by binding to opioid receptors, restoring normal respiration. Naloxone Let's move on to seizure. A seizure is a sudden uncontrolled electrical disturbance in the brain. A seizure can sometimes be referred to as a fit. This condition is supported with emergency medicine with medications and supportive care. Seizure. Decontamination involves the removal or neutralization of harmful substances from a person. This is often necessary in cases of chemical exposure or contamination. Decontamination. In today's lesson, we will explore essential medical examination terminology. Understanding these words is crucial for effective communication in healthcare settings. Our first term is physical examination. This is a thorough assessment of a patient's body to evaluate their overall health. Physical examinations involve checking vital signs, palpating for abnormalities, and visually inspecting the body. Blood pressure measurement is the measurement of the force of blood against the walls of the arteries. Blood pressure is typically recorded as systolic or diastolic pressure in millimetres of mercury. An X-ray is a diagnostic imaging technique that uses electromagnetic radiation to create images of the internal structures of the body. X-rays are commonly used to visualise bones and detect abnormalities in the lungs and other organs. Ultrasound is a non-invasive imaging technique that uses high-frequency sound waves to create real-time images of internal organs. Ultrasounds are often used during pregnancy to monitor fetal development and for abdominal and pelvic examinations. MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is a medical imaging technique that uses strong magnetic fields and radio waves to generate detailed images of the body's internal structures. MRIs provide high resolution images of soft tissues like the brain, spinal cord and joints. An ECG or electrocardiogram is a test that records the electrical activity of the heart over time. These are crucial tests in diagnosing heart conditions by displaying the heart's rhythm and identifying irregularities. The next few terms involve blood and internal examinations. So if you're a little bit squeamish, skip ahead to the time indicated on screen. A blood test is a laboratory analysis of a blood sample to assess for various health markers. Blood tests can reveal information about blood cell counts, cholesterol levels and the presence of infections or diseases. Endoscopy is a procedure that uses a flexible tube with a camera to examine the interior of organs or body cavities. Endoscopies are commonly performed to inspect the gastrointestinal tract, throat or bladder. A biopsy is a medical procedure involving the removal of a small sample of tissues or cells from a patient's body for examination under a microscope. Biopsies are performed to diagnose the presence of diseases or conditions such as cancer or infections. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of healthcare professions. Each of these medical professions play a unique and vital role in the healthcare ecosystem. So if you're ready, let's embark on this journey together. And first up, we have the speech language pathologist. These are experts in communication and swallowing disorders. 
they assess, diagnose, and provide therapy to restore effective communication. Speech language pathologists work with children and adults, helping those with speech, language, voice, and fluency disorders regain their ability to communicate effectively. Next up, we have occupational therapists. They are dedicated to helping individuals regain and improve their abilities to perform daily life activities. Occupational therapists work with patients of all ages who, due to physical, mental or developmental conditions, need assistance in learning new ways to perform day-to-day -day activities. Physical therapists specialize in diagnosing and treating injuries and conditions affecting a person's physical movement and function. They use various therapies, exercises and techniques to aid recovery. Physical therapists design personalized treatment plans for patients targeting pain relief, improved mobility and the restoration of function. Our next profession is a radiologic technologist. This medical professional is responsible for performing various medical imaging procedures, such as x-rays and MRIs, ensuring the accurate capture of diagnostic images. They play an important role in diagnostic imaging, working closely with patients and physicians to capture high quality images, essential for medical diagnosis and treatment planning. Respiratory therapists specialize in the care of individuals with breathing and cardiopulmonary disorders. They provide critical treatments, therapies and diagnostic testing to ensure optimal respiratory health. Respiratory therapists work with patients of all ages, from premature infants with underdeveloped lungs to elderly individuals with chronic respiratory conditions. Medical laboratory technicians are the unseen heroes of healthcare, conducting essential tests on patient samples to assist in disease diagnosis and monitoring. Pharmacists are medication experts, ensuring the safe and effective use of prescription and over-the-counter drugs. They provide medication counselling, oversee drug dispensing and collaborate with healthcare providers to optimise patient medication regimes. Physician assistants practice medicine under physician supervision. They diagnose, treat and manage various medical conditions, offering a wide range of healthcare services. Dental hygienists specialize in oral health, providing preventative dental care, cleaning teeth and educating patients on proper oral hygiene practices. They work closely with dentists to ensure optimal oral health and often perform teeth cleanings, oral examinations and education on maintaining healthy teeth and gums. An optometrist is an eye care specialist who will examine, diagnose and treat vision problems and eye diseases. They prescribe corrective lenses such as eyeglasses and contact lenses and provide comprehensive vision care services. Optometrists also detect and manage various eye conditions, contributing to overall eye health. Chiropractors specialize in musculoskeletal health, emphasizing manual adjustments to the spine and other parts of the body to relieve pain and improve function. Chiropractors use non-invasive techniques to treat conditions such as back pain, neck pain, and other musculoskeletal issues often without the need for surgery or medication. Our next professional role is a nutritionist, which can also be known as a dietitian. These are experts in food and nutrition, helping individuals make healthy food choices, manage dietary restrictions and address nutritional needs. They work in various settings, including healthcare facilities, schools and private practice, offering personalized nutrition guidance and education. Clinical psychologists provide therapy and counselling for individuals dealing with mental health issues and emotional well-being, helping patients overcome challenges and improve their mental health. Clinical psychologists use evidence-based approaches to diagnose and treat various psychological conditions, supporting patients on their journey to mental well-being. 
Medical social workers offer vital support to patients and families, helping them cope with medical conditions and navigate the healthcare system. They provide emotional support, connect patients with necessary resources, and ensure that patients' psychosocial needs are addressed throughout their medical journey. A paramedic or an EMT, EMT stands for Emergency Medical Technicians, are the first responders delivering emergency medical care and transportation to individuals facing injuries or acute medical conditions. They provide immediate medical intervention, including administrating medications, performing life-saving procedures, and transporting patients to medical facilities for further care. An audiologist is a medical professional who specializes in hearing and balance disorders, providing diagnostic evaluations and treatments for patients of all ages. They help individuals with hearing impairments by offering solutions such as hearing aids and assistive listening devices. Prosthesis design, fit and fabricate prosthetic limbs and braces to help individuals regain mobility and functionality. They work closely with patients to customize and provide these devices, offering improved quality of life. Medical illustrators combine their artistic skills with medical knowledge to create detailed illustrations and visual aids used in medical textbooks, patient education materials, and presentations. They play a crucial role in simplifying complex medical concepts for various audiences. Medical librarians manage and organize medical information and research resources in healthcare settings. They assist healthcare professionals in finding the latest medical literature and research, supporting evidence-based practice. Medical dosimetrists work in radiation oncology, calculating radiation doses and treatment plans for patients undergoing radiation therapy. They collaborate with radiation oncologists and medical physicists to ensure the safe and effective delivery of this treatment. In today's lesson, we're going to take a look at some medicine English vocabulary. This will involve looking at the different types and forms of medicine, along with the associated symptoms. Let's take a look at our lesson plan. You'll learn lots of important vocabulary, along with perfect pronunciation and lots of context and information. So you'll really get to know the vocabulary very well. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to start this lesson. So grab a pen and paper, sit back, relax, and let's learn some English on medicine together. First up, we're going to explore symptoms in a question format and have a look at the associated medication that is used as treatment for these symptoms. Our first question is, do you have an infection? Do you have an infection? If you have a bacterial infection, you will need an antibiotic. Repeat after me, antibiotic. Another type of infection that is common is a viral infection, an infection by a virus. And we use antiviral medication to treat a viral infection. Antiviral. Our next question is, do you have pain or fever? Do you have pain or fever? For these symptoms, you would take a painkiller. Repeat after me, painkiller. Our next question is, do you have a cough? The word cough has an unusual pronunciation. Instead of a G sound, we have an F sound here. Do you have a cough? And the medicine for a cough has a few different names. It can be called cough syrup, cough medicine, or a cough suppressant. My next question to you is, do you have allergies? Do you have allergies? 
And for an allergy, we take an antihistamine. Repeat after me. Antihistamine. Let's do that one one more time. Antihistamine. Our next question is, do you have asthma? Do you have asthma? The type of medicine used for asthma is a steroid. Repeat after me. Steroid. Let's move on to our next question. Do you have a blocked nose? Or we could say, do you have a stuffy nose? If you have this condition, you will need a decongestant. Repeat after me. Decongestant. And a medicine which is in the news a lot lately is related to the coronavirus. And the medicine that is being discussed is a vaccine. Repeat after me. Vaccine. Let's hope that the new vaccine is successful in the battle against coronavirus. And let's move on to the next segment, which is different forms of medicine. We will discuss the different ways in which medicine is delivered to the human body. Medicine is often given in liquid form, and sometimes it is given in a syrup. This is a thick liquid medicine that you drink, and it can be sweet. This type of thick liquid medicine is common for symptoms in children, coughs and colds, or for adults with stomach problems. Sometimes liquid medicine needs to be given directly into the body, like into the bloodstream or into muscle. This medicine is usually given through an injection with a syringe. Liquids can also be given directly into the body by intravenous therapy. This is regularly used in hospitals to deliver medicine to patients and the device used is simply called an IV. Medicine can also be given in tablet or pill form. Lots of different types of medication can be given in this form. And this medicine is usually round or oval shaped. Another type of tablet you may see is a soluble tablet. These tablets can be dissolved in water. The resulting mixture is then drank to cure symptoms. These types of tablets are typically used for painkillers and antacids. The next form of medication we will look at is a capsule. A capsule is a shell which contains medicine. Some people will also call these tablets or pills and the capsule dissolves and is digested when swallowed. The next type of medicine we will look at is a lozenge. A lozenge is a small candy-like medicine that dissolves in your mouth. Lozenges are usually used to help symptoms in the mouth or throat. Our next type of medicine can be called a cream, lotion or ointment. And this is a thick liquid medicine that is applied to the skin. Our next type of medicine is drops. This type of liquid medicine is usually used for symptoms for the eyes or the ears. The next form of medicine we will have a look at is spray. This type of liquid medicine is usually applied up the nose or onto the skin depending on the symptoms. The final form of medicine we will have a look at is inhaler. An inhaler is used to deliver vapor medicine to the lungs. It is commonly used by people who suffer from asthma. Up next, we are going to take a look at the difference between these two terms, over-the-counter and prescription drugs. First up, let's take a look at over-the-counter and what that means. Medicine which is over-the-counter can be purchased without consent from a doctor. Depending on the country, this type of medicine can be purchased in drugstores, pharmacies or even supermarkets. 
Whereas with prescription drugs, this type of medicine can be purchased only with consent from the doctor and purchased at a registered pharmacy or chemist. The consent is usually given as a paper document simply called a prescription. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. If you're worried about any of the symptoms that we discussed in today's lesson, make sure to talk to your local doctor. Today, we're delving into the world of over-the-counter medications, those readily available without a prescription. By the end of this video, you'll be bursting with lots of new English vocabulary. We are going to explore 12 popular medications you can buy over the counter. We're going to learn their pronunciation along with related symptoms, plus lots and lots of synonyms. Also, for every medication type, I will give you two phrases and questions for the pharmacy to really help contextualize the terms and boost your conversational skills. Let's dive into the world of self-care and medicine. And first, let's break down the term over the counter. This term refers to medications or products that are available for purchase without requiring a prescription from a healthcare professional. These products are typically deemed safe for use without direct supervision by a doctor and are accessible to consumers directly from pharmacies, drugstores, or other retail outlets. Let's move on to our medication types. An analgesic can also be known as a pain reliever and can help with lots of different types of pain, like a headache, toothache, dental pain, or even a backache. Another term for analgesic could be painkiller. Common examples of an analgesic include acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Let's take a look at our example sentences. Hi, I have a headache. Can you recommend an analgesic and advise on dosage? The term dosage or dose relates to the quantity of medicine you need to take for your condition. And this information will also tell you how many times a day you need to take it. Let's move on to our next example sentence. I have some dental pain. Could I get some aspirin, please? Aspirin is a common drug for relieving minor aches, pains, and fevers. People also use it as an anti-inflammatory or a blood thinner. Our next medication type is an antihistamine. Repeat after me. Antihistamine. This type of drug is used to treat allergies and it can also be referred to as allergy medication. An allergy is where your body reacts to something that's normally harmless, like pollen, dust, nuts, or animal fur. The symptoms can be mild, but for some people, they can be very serious. Examples of antihistamine drugs include loratadine and diphenhydramine. Let's move on to our example sentences. I have seasonal allergies. Which antihistamine do you suggest, and how often should I take it? I am suffering from some hay fever. Can you recommend an antihistamine? Hay fever is an allergic reaction to pollen, usually when it comes into contact with your mouth, nose, eyes and throat. Pollen is a fine powder that comes from plants. Our next over-the-counter medication is a decongestant. Decongestants relieve nasal congestion. Nasal congestion is more commonly referred to as a stuffy nose or a blocked nose, and the medical term for this condition is rhinitis. Examples of this medication include pseudoephedrine and phenylephrine. I'm congested. Could you recommend a decongestant, and how often should I use it? I have a really stuffy nose. Which decongestant is the best, in your opinion? An expectorant helps loosen mucus. A more common term for an expectorant is cough medicine or cough syrup. This medicine helps with a condition known as a chest infection. And mucus is the slippery green substance that can cause congestion in our lungs when we're sick. 
It can also be referred to as phlegm. Wifenicin is a common example of an expectorant medication. Let's check out our example sentences. I have a chest infection with a lot of mucus. Which expectorant would you suggest? Hello, I need to get some cough medicine for my son. Which one is best for children? Another medication helped to use a cough is an antitussiv. An antitussiv suppresses coughing, so we can also call this medication a cough suppressant. This type of medication is usually given in the form of a syrup, just like the expectorant. A widely used cough suppressant is dextromethorphan. My cough is keeping me up at night. Can you recommend an antitussive? And what's the recommended dosage? I've had a cough for a few days. Do you think I need an expectorant or a suppressant? If you're really interested in learning more medical English, you should definitely check out my channel Learning English Pro, where I have a vast assortment of medical related English vocabulary lessons. Medical related videos are my most popular topic on YouTube, so I'm constantly adding to this playlist every week. All the links for these videos and playlists are in the video description waiting for you. Antacids neutralize stomach acid, relieving symptoms of indigestion and heartburn. Antacids are available in different forms of medication, such as liquids or chewable tablets. Common examples of antacid include Tums and Malox. I'm experiencing heartburn. Which antacid is effective? And how many tablets can I take at once? I have indigestion. Would you recommend a liquid or chewable tablet antacid? Let's move on to laxatives. Laxatives promote bowel movements and are helpful if one is suffering from constipation. There are lots of different types of laxatives. Common types include stimulants and bulk forming laxatives. I'm constipated and need a laxative. How long does it usually take to work? Hi, my elderly mother is having trouble with her bowel movements. Is there a laxative you could suggest for an older person? On the opposite side of the scale, we have an antidiarrheal. Antidiarrheals control diarrhea. With the word diarrhea, we have different spellings in American and British English. Diarrhea is when your stools are loose and watery. You may also need to go to the bathroom more often. And for this condition, lepiramide is a commonly used antidiarrheal. I have an upset stomach and diarrhea. Can you recommend an antidiarrheal? And how often should I take it? I have had diarrhea for a few days. Can you suggest an antidiarrheal that is fast working and effective? Let's move on to topical analgesic. Topical analgesics relieve pain on the skin or muscles. This type of medication can be referred to as pain relieving cream or ointment. Examples of topical analgesics include creams or patches containing menthol or lidocaine. Let's check out our example sentences. I have muscle soreness. Would a topical analgesic like a menthol cream help and how often should I apply it? I have some muscle pain in my thigh. Could I have a skin patch with an analgesic? Our next over-the-counter medication is an antifungal. Antifungals treat fungal infections, such as athlete's foots or rashes of a similar type. Antifungals can sometimes be referred to as a fungicide. And clotrimazole is a common antifungal you can find in your pharmacy. 
I have a rash on my feet. Could you recommend an antifungal cream, please? I have a fungal infection under my arm. Could you suggest an antifungal suitable for that area? An antiseptic can be used to disinfect cuts and wounds. And they can also be referred to as disinfectants or germicides. Hydrogen peroxide and iodine are common antiseptics. I cut myself. Is an antiseptic like hydrogen peroxide suitable and how should I use it on the wound? I burnt myself last night on the stove. Could you suggest a mild antiseptic? Our twelfth and final medication type is motion sickness medication. These medications help prevent and relieve motion sickness. Motion sickness is having symptoms such as dizziness, nausea and vomiting while travelling. Common options for motion sickness medication include Dimenhydrinate and Mescalzine. Can you recommend a motion sickness medication and when should I take it before travelling? I get very sick when I'm a passenger in the car. Which medication is best for motion sickness? today and in this lesson we'll be delving into the world of the pharmaceutical industry. If you're new to this field you're in the right place. We'll be exploring 15 essential terms with more detailed definitions to get you started. If you're ready let's jump right in. The pharmaceutical industry is a vast sector responsible for researching, developing, manufacturing and distributing medications that improve human health and well-being. We also have the term pharma, which is a commonly used abbreviation of the word pharmaceutical. This term is often used informally to describe the entire pharmaceutical field and is frequently used in discussions and news related to the industry. Let's take a closer look at this word medication. A medication is a substance used for medical treatment, such as pills, capsules or syrups. Medications can treat a wide range of conditions, from pain relief to chronic diseases. With this industry, you'll hear a lot about drug discovery. This is the intricate process of identifying and designing new medications through research and experimentation. This includes the initial identification of potential compounds to extensive laboratory testing. Clinical trials are carefully designed experiments to test the safety and efficacy of new drugs before they are approved for use. These trials involve multiple phases and help determine whether a drug is safe and effective. Let's move on to our next bit of terminology, which is prescription drug. A prescription drug is a medication that can only be obtained with a doctor's written order. They are typically used for serious medical conditions and require professional guidance. There is also over-the-counter medication which is available without a prescription and can be purchased directly from a pharmacy or store. These are generally for common self-treatable ailments. Another type of medication you'll hear about is a vaccine. A vaccine is a substance that stimulates the immune system to protect against specific diseases. Vaccines have been instrumental in preventing and controlling infectious diseases like polio and measles. Drug regulatory authorities are responsible for ensuring the safety and effectiveness of drugs. They review and approve medications before they reach the market. And on screen for you, you can see a selection of these authorities from different English-speaking countries. 
Probably the most widely known of these would be the FDA in the United States. A pharmaceutical company is an organization that researches, develops and manufactures medications. These companies range from small research focused firms to large global corporations. A generic drug is a medication that is equivalent to a brand name drug, but is usually more affordable. They contain the same active ingredients and meet the same quality standards. The term biotechnology involves using living organisms and biological systems to develop new drugs and treatments. This field has led to the creation of therapies like biologic drugs. Clinical data refers to information gathered during clinical trials, helping to assess a drug's effectiveness. It includes data on patient demographics, safety, efficacy and adverse reactions. Adverse reactions are more commonly known as side effects. These are unintended and often unwanted effects of a medication, which may happen in addition to its intended effects. Understanding potential side effects is crucial for safe medication use. A placebo is a substance with no therapeutic effect. It is used in clinical trials as a control to compare with the effects of the drug being tested. Placebos help researchers assess the true impact of a medication. Pharmacovigilance is the science and activities related to the detection, assessment, understanding and prevention of adverse effects or any other drug related issues. It plays a key role in ensuring medication safety, even after a drug is on the market. In this English lesson, you will learn phrases for the pharmacy. This lesson is broken down into five different categories, so you'll definitely learn lots of useful English. So let's get started and our first category is prescription medication. Can I have my prescription filled here? Can I have my prescription filled here? How should I take this medication? How should I take this medication? What are the side effects of this drug? What are the side effects of this drug? Is this medication safe with my allergies? Is this medication safe with my allergies? Can I get a refill on this prescription? Can I get a refill on this prescription? What should I do if I miss a dose? What should I do if I miss a dose? In our next category, we will ask questions about over-the-counter medication. What is a good remedy for a headache? What is a good remedy for a headache? Do you have something for cold symptoms? Do you have something for cold symptoms? Can you recommend an allergy relief medicine? Can you recommend an allergy relief medicine? 
Is there an over-the-counter drug for coughs? Is there an over-the-counter drug for coughs? What should I take for stomach pain? What should I take for stomach pain? Do you have any natural supplements? Do you have any natural supplements? Our third set of phrases and questions relate to general health queries. What vitamins should I take for better health? What vitamins should I take for better health? Do you have sunscreen for sensitive skin? Do you have sunscreen for sensitive skin? What are the best products for skin care? What are the best products for skin care? Can you suggest a good pain reliever? Can you suggest a good pain reliever? Which product is best for wound healing? Which product is best for wound healing? How do I check my blood pressure? How do I check my blood pressure? Let's move on to our fourth category, which is queries about pharmacy services. Do you offer flu shots here? Do you offer flu shots here? Can I schedule a health checkup? Can I schedule a health checkup? Is there a pharmacist available for consultation? Is there a pharmacist available for consultation? Can I get travel vaccinations here? Can I get travel vaccinations here? Do you provide medicine home delivery? Do you provide medicine home delivery? Are there any health screenings available? Are there any health screenings available? Our last category deals with phrases relating to specific conditions. What's best for managing diabetes? What's best for managing diabetes? Can you recommend something for arthritis pain? Can you recommend something for arthritis pain? What do you have for heartburn relief? What do you have for heartburn relief? Is there an effective treatment for insomnia? Is there an effective treatment for insomnia? What options are there for high blood pressure? What options are there for high blood pressure? Do you have products for asthma relief? Do you have products for asthma relief?
Get ready to learn lots of new English vocabulary on pregnancy. Let's take a look at our lesson plan for this video. In this lesson, you will learn lots of key vocabulary and you'll learn the pronunciation and meaning of each word. And you'll understand the context of these words with lots of example sentences. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to start this lesson. Sit back, relax, grab a pen and paper, and let's learn some English together right now. Our first word marks the very beginning of our journey. The egg. Repeat after me. Egg. The egg is the female sex cell. Let's move on and take a look at the male sex cell. Sperm. Repeat after me. Sperm. The moment the two sex cells come together in intercourse is called conception. Repeat after me. Conception. After conception and for the first two weeks, we call the baby at this stage a zygote. Repeat after me. Zygote. After the first two weeks and until the eighth week, we call the baby an embryo. Repeat after me. Embryo. After the eighth week and until birth, the baby is referred to as the fetus. Repeat after me. Fetus. The baby is connected to the mother by the umbilical cord. Repeat after me. Umbilical cord. And the baby is fed through the placenta. Repeat after me. Placenta. When a person is carrying a baby, we say that they are pregnant. Repeat after me. Pregnant. Let's take a look at our first simple example sentence. She is pregnant. She is pregnant. A common idiom we use to describe pregnant women is expecting a baby. Expecting a baby. Let's take a look at this idiom in an example sentence. She is expecting a baby. She is expecting a baby. And there is a similar idiom, having a baby. Having a baby. You could say, she is having a baby. She is having a baby. A lot of people discover they are pregnant by using a pregnancy test. Repeat after me. Pregnancy test. Some people have difficulty conceiving naturally. They may use in vitro fertilization. This is more commonly known as IVF. Repeat after me. IVF. Another method used by couples who are experiencing difficulty having a baby is surrogacy. Let's take a look at the definition. Surrogacy is an arrangement often supported by a legal agreement whereby a woman agrees to bear a child for another person or persons who will become the child's parent after birth. The embryo or baby is implanted in the uterus of the surrogate mother who carries the baby until birth. So the surrogate is the person who carries the baby for another couple or person. An example sentence is, they are having a baby by surrogacy. They are having a baby by surrogacy. If this is your first time visiting my channel, Learning English Pro, you're very welcome. My name is Jer and I hope you're really enjoying this lesson. Please take the time to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. 
coming up next in our vocabulary, we'll be taking a look at the symptoms of pregnancy. A symptom which is commonly referred to in English-speaking culture is morning sickness. Repeat after me, morning sickness. This can also be called nausea. Repeat after me, nausea. Another symptom of pregnancy is fatigue. Repeat after me, fatigue. This could also be called tiredness. Another symptom which may be experienced is swollen breasts. Swollen breasts. And just when you think it couldn't get any worse, women can also suffer from increased urination. Increased urination. As the baby grows in a woman's belly, we call the bigger area the baby bump. Repeat after me, baby bump. And with a baby bump comes the need for new clothing. The clothing that is needed for pregnant women is called maternity wear or maternity clothing. If you were looking in a store, you could say, do you have maternity wear in this store? Another aspect for a growing stomach in pregnancy is stretch marks. Repeat after me, stretch marks. And it is quite common to use some form of skin lotion to help combat the appearance of stretch marks. The duration of a pregnancy is usually 40 weeks or nine months. And the day a baby is expected is called the due date. Due date. As the due date approaches, a woman may experience labor. These are the pains and discomfort that come along when the baby is arriving. Labor. We would say she is in labor. She is in labor. A nurse which helps mothers in this time is called a midwife. Repeat after me, midwife. And the event of a baby's arrival is called the birth. Repeat after me, birth. So very shortly in the video, we'll be seeing some live footage of a birth. So if you're a bit squeamish, skip ahead about 50 seconds and you should miss it. When a baby is born without any medical intervention, it is called a natural birth. Natural birth. Sometimes babies will be born through a surgical method called a cesarean section. Repeat after me cesarean section. This is often shorted to just C-section. C-section. Or it may be called a cesarean birth. One more time. Cesarean birth. Also commonly used is a local anesthetic during the birth process. This is more commonly known as an epidural. Repeat after me. Epidural. And can you believe it's our last word and the result of a pregnancy? Newborn. Repeat after me. Newborn. In today's video, we're delving into the world of prescription medication. Prescription drugs are a critical part of healthcare and understanding them is essential for informed decision making. Let's start our video with our main topic, prescription medication. These are medications that require a doctor's prescription for purchase or a doctor's permission. They are often used for treating specific medical conditions and these types of medications are regulated to ensure safe and effective use. The prescription itself is actually the piece of paper where the doctor's orders are written on. 
and you're going to take this piece of paper, the prescription, to a pharmacist. This is the healthcare professional who dispenses prescription medications and provides guidance on their use. They play a vital role in patient care and can offer you lots of advice. When you get a prescription, you will also get information and instructions relating to dosage. Dosage refers to the amount and frequency of a medication prescribed by a healthcare provider, so how much you can take and when you can take it. It's crucial to follow the recommended dosage for safe and effective treatment. Side effects are unintended effects of medication, which may happen in addition to its intended effects. So this means that you might feel a bit sick from taking medication. Understanding potential side effects is important for patient safety. And as a patient, if you suffer from any side effects while taking medication, it's important to contact your doctor or your pharmacist. When it comes to picking the type of medication, there are two types. The first we'll look at is generic medication. This is an affordable equivalent to a brand name drug containing the same ingredients. It provides cost-effective options for patients. Now this term, which I've just mentioned, brand name medication, means the original version of a drug developed by a pharmaceutical company. It's often more expensive than generic alternatives. If you are unable for some reason to get prescription medication, you might be able to use over-the-counter medication. This is available without a prescription and can be purchased directly from a pharmacy or a store like a supermarket sometimes. These are typically used for common self-treatable illnesses and ailments. Our next term is drug interactions. These happen when one medication affects the action of another. So these can happen to people who have to take lots of different types of medications. Understanding potential interactions is really crucial to avoid adverse effects. Adverse reactions or adverse effects are unexpected and harmful effects caused by medication. They're like really extreme side effects. They can range from mild to severe and require immediate medical attention. A prescription refill allows patients to obtain additional doses of their prescribed medication. It's essential to follow refill instructions and schedules. Depending on the country, you can sometimes ring your pharmacist for a prescription refill or you may need to contact your doctor. Next up, we're going to have a look at two different organizations, the FDA in the United States and the MHRA in the United Kingdom. These are drug regulatory authorities responsible for ensuring the safety and effectiveness of prescription drugs. The medication label provides important information about a prescription drug. This can include dosing instructions, side effects, and usage precautions. When you receive your prescription medication, it generally comes with a patient information leaflet. This document offers comprehensive information about the drug, its effects, and safety guidelines. It's a good idea to give it a read over before you take your prescription medication for the first time. Something which will be clearly marked on your medication is its prescription expiration date. This indicates when a prescription medication should no longer be used. It's important to adhere to this date for safety. An important thing to remember for anyone taking prescription medication is medication adherence. This is the practice of taking prescription drugs as directed by a healthcare provider, like a doctor, nurse, or pharmacist, and this helps you to achieve the intended therapeutic effect. Today, we're delving into the captivating world of psychology, exploring essential psychological terms. Whether you're a psychology student or just curious about the human mind, this video is for you. 
And as usual, all the terms covered in today's lesson are available for you in the video description if you want to follow along or revise after the lesson. So let's get started with our first term, which is the topic of our lesson, psychology. Psychology is the scientific study of the human mind and behavior. It seeks to understand and explain our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Psychology. Next up, we have the word behavior, which has different spellings in American and British English. Behavior encompasses all actions and reactions of an individual or organism, from simple reflexes to complex interactions. Behavior. Now let's explore cognition. Cognition refers to mental processes such as perception, thinking, reasoning, and problem solving. Repeat after me. Cognition. Emotion is our next term. Emotions are complex psychological and physiological responses to events or situations involving feelings like joy, fear, anger, and more. Emotion. Moving on to memory. Memory is the ability to store, retain, and recall information and experiences. Memory. Consciousness is the awareness of one's thoughts, feelings, and surroundings at any given moment. Consciousness. Next, we have perception. Perception is the process of interpreting sensory information to understand and make sense of the world. Perception. Stress is a psychological and physiological response to challenging situations, often leading to feelings of tension or anxiety. Stress. Now, motivation. Motivation is the internal or external drive that initiates, directs, and sustains behavior towards a goal. Motivation. Personality is a unique set of enduring characteristics, behaviors, and traits that define an individual. Personality. Moving on to intelligence. Intelligence is the capacity to learn, reason, and solve problems effectively. Intelligence. Our next term is abnormal psychology. This is the study of atypical behaviors and psychological disorders, aiming to understand and treat them. Abnormal psychology. Therapy refers to the various treatments and interventions used by psychologists and mental health professionals to help individuals improve their psychological well-being. Therapy. Our next term is social psychology. This focuses on how individuals are influenced by social interactions and the impacts of groups on behavior and attitudes. Social psychology. We also have developmental psychology. This type of psychology examines the psychological growth and changes that happen from infancy to old age. Developmental psychology. The word I've already mentioned is anxiety. Anxiety is a state of uneasiness or worry, often accompanied by physical symptoms such as increased heart rate and restlessness. Repeat after me, anxiety. Depression is a mood disorder, 
characterized by persistent sadness and a loss of interest or pleasure in activities. Depression. The term self-esteem means an individual's overall evaluation of their self-worth and self-perception. Self-esteem. Schizophrenia is a severe mental disorder characterized by disorganized thinking, hallucinations, and a loss of contact with reality. Repeat after me, schizophrenia. Psychotherapy is a form of treatment involving psychological techniques and talking to a trained therapist to address emotional and mental health issues. Psychotherapy. Today we're delving into crucial English vocabulary relating to medical surgery. This video is really useful for healthcare professionals and for those going for surgery. As this video covers medical surgery, there will be some images and videos of actual surgery, so bear that in mind as you're watching the lesson. So with all of that business out of the way, let's get to it. Our first word is surgeon. A surgeon is a highly skilled medical professional specializing in performing surgical procedures. Surgeons undergo extensive training to acquire the expertise needed to operate on patients addressing various medical conditions. They play a pivotal role in healthcare, working with precision and care to ensure the best possible outcomes for their patients. Anesthesia is a medical practice involving the administration of medications to induce a reversible loss of sensation or consciousness. It is a crucial aspect of surgery, ensuring that patients remain pain-free and unaware during the procedure. An anesthesiologist is a specialized medical doctor responsible for providing anesthesia and monitoring the patient's vital signs during surgery. They play a critical role in ensuring the patient's safety and comfort throughout the entire surgical process. It's important to note that there are two different types of anesthesia. General anesthesia, which involves inducing a state of controlled unconsciousness in a patient, or local anesthesia. This is a technique used to numb a specific part of the body, allowing the patient to remain conscious during surgery while preventing pain in the targeted area. This is the type of anesthesia you'll get at your dentist. Next up, we have the scalpel. This is a precision surgical instrument with a small sharp blade used by surgeons to make precise incisions during medical procedures. The design of the scalpel allows for controlled and accurate cutting, minimizing tissue damage and facilitating the surgeon's ability to navigate delicate anatomical structures. And the word incision refers to the deliberate cut made with the scalpel to access a specific area of the body during a medical procedure. The size and location of the incision depend on the nature of the surgery and skilled surgeons take great care to make incisions that promote optimal healing and minimize scarring. The incision site is the specific area on the patient's body where the surgical incision is made. Proper preparation and care are taken to ensure the cleanliness and sterilization of the incision site before surgery and this helps to prevent infections and promote a smooth healing process. Sutures are stitches or materials used by surgeons to sew the edges of an incision together after a surgical procedure. Suture is also a verb, you can suture a wound. 
The materials used for a suture vary in composition and the choice of suture depends on factors such as type of surgery, the location of the incision and the desired outcome of the wound healing process. Preoperative is a term that refers to the period before surgery when medical professionals conduct assessments, prepare the patient and provide necessary information about the upcoming procedure. This phase includes obtaining informed consent, which we'll discuss in a moment, conducting medical tests and ensuring the patient is physically and mentally ready for surgery. Post-operative encompasses the period after surgery, focusing on the patient's recovery and the monitoring of any potential complications. Medical professionals closely observe patients in the post-operative phase, providing necessary care, pain management and guidance on post-surgical activities to promote a smooth and successful recovery. The operating room, often referred to as the OR, is a specially designed and sterile environment where surgical procedures take place. Equipped with advanced medical technology, the operating room provides surgeons with the necessary tools and resources to perform surgeries safely and efficiently. On the other hand, we have the recovery room, this is the designated space where patients awaken from the effects of anesthesia after surgery. In this area, medical professionals closely monitor patients as they regain consciousness, ensuring a smooth transition from the surgical environment and addressing any immediate post-operative needs. Informed consent is a formal agreement given by the patient after understanding the details, risks and benefits of a proposed surgical procedure. It is a crucial ethical and legal aspect of medical practice, ensuring that patients are well informed and actively participate in decisions regarding their health care. Our next term is hemostasis. This is the physiological process of stopping bleeding or controlling bleeding flow during surgery. Surgeons employ various techniques such as sutures, cauterization and the use of hemostatic agents to achieve hemostasis and prevent excessive bleeding, promoting a safe and successful surgical outcome. If you are a medical professional learning English, or perhaps you're just curious in the topic, you should head over to my channel, Learning English Pro, where I have lots and lots of medical vocabularies waiting for you. And I have lots of them linked on screen and linked in the video description below. So check those out after the video and really boost your medical English vocabulary. Now it's time to take the vocabulary we've just learned and make some really great English phrases for them. I'll say each sentence twice and give you a chance to say it after me. Don't worry if you fall behind, just press pause. Let's start with our first phrase. I understand the risks and give my informed consent for the surgery. Listen to the sentence again and then repeat after me. I understand the risks and give my informed consent for the surgery. Okay, let's move on to our next sentence. The anesthesiologist will discuss the type of anesthesia you'll receive. The anesthesiologist will discuss the type of anesthesia you'll receive. The surgeon will make an incision in this area. Repeat after me. The surgeon will make an incision in this area. Our next sentence is The operation will take place in the operating room. The operation will take place in the operating room. You'll be under general anesthesia during the surgery. 
You'll be under general anesthesia during the surgery. Please prepare the patient for surgery in the preoperative area. Please prepare the patient for surgery in the preoperative area. The incision site will be cleaned and sterilized before the procedure. Repeat after me. The incision site will be cleaned and sterilized before the procedure. The nurse will assist in suturing the wound post surgery. The nurse will assist in suturing the wound post surgery. The recovery room is where you'll wake up after the operation. Repeat after me. The recovery room is where you'll wake up after the operation. The surgeon will ensure proper hemostasis to control bleeding during the procedure. The surgeon will ensure proper hemostasis to control bleeding during the procedure. Today, we're delving into the diverse world of medical procedures, exploring various types of surgeries. Now a word of warning. In this lesson, you will see scenes of surgeries and human anatomy. Some scenes are not for the squeamish, so please bear that in mind as we embark on our lesson. So let's get started. And this promises to be quite a difficult lesson for English pronunciation. So we're going to take some of the words quite slowly. Laparoscopy is our first type of surgery. This is a minimally invasive surgical procedure that involves making small incisions in the abdomen to insert a camera and specialized tools. This technique allows surgeons to view and operate on internal organs with less trauma and a faster recovery time compared to traditional open surgery. So let's try this word one more time. Laparoscopy. A cholecystectomy is the surgical removal of the gallbladder, commonly performed to treat gallstones or other gallbladder related conditions. The procedure can be done through traditional open surgery or with laparoscopy. Let's check our pronunciation one more time. Cholecystectomy. Our next surgery type is a bit easier to pronounce. Vascular surgery. This focuses on treating conditions affecting the blood vessels, such as arteries and veins. Surgeons in this field address issues like aneurysms, blockages, and vascular malformations, employing both open and minimally invasive techniques. Vascular surgery. Our next term is appendectomy. This is the surgical removal of the appendix, often necessary when it becomes inflamed or infected, a condition known as appendicitis. This procedure is typically performed urgently to prevent complications. Repeat after me. Appendectomy. A hysterectomy involves the surgical removal of the uterus and sometimes the cervix. This procedure is performed for various reasons, including treating conditions such as uterine cancer, fibroids, or severe endometriosis. Hysterectomy. And our next surgery type is endoscopy. Endoscopy is a diagnostic or therapeutic procedure that uses a flexible tube with a light and camera to visualize the interior of organs or cavities. It is valuable for detecting abnormalities and performing minimally invasive interventions. Endoscopy. 
A hysteroscopy is a procedure that involves the insertion of a thin, lighted tube into the uterus to examine and treat conditions affecting the uterine lining, such as abnormal bleeding or polyps. Repeat after me, hysteroscopy. Our next surgery type is gastric bypass surgery. This is a weight loss procedure that involves rerouting the digestive system to create a smaller stomach pouch. This restricts the amount of food intake and promotes weight loss, often recommended for individuals with severe obesity. Gastric bypass surgery. Cataract surgery is a common procedure to remove a cloudy lens from the eye and replace it with an artificial lens. This surgery improves vision and is often performed as an outpatient procedure. Cataract surgery. Let's move on to coronary artery bypass surgery. This is a cardiac procedure that addresses blocked or narrowed coronary arteries. Surgeons use grafts to create new pathways for blood flow, restoring blood supply to the heart muscle. Coronary artery bypass surgery. A hip replacement involves replacing a damaged or diseased hip joint with an artificial implant. This surgical intervention is common for individuals experiencing hip arthritis or severe joint damage. Hip replacement. A tonsillectomy is the surgical removal of the tonsils, often performed to address recurrent tonsillitis or other throat-related issues. The procedure is more common in children, but can be performed at any age. Repeat after me. Tonsillectomy. Our next surgical term is a bit tricky. Carotid endarterectomy. This is a surgical procedure to remove plaque or blockages from the carotid arteries, which supply blood to the brain. This helps prevent strokes to improve blood flow. Carotid endarterectomy. A caesarean section or C-section is a surgical delivery method in which a baby is delivered through an incision made in the mother's abdominal and uterine walls. It is performed when a vaginal delivery poses a risk to the mother or baby caesarean section or c-section. A breast biopsy is a diagnostic procedure involving the removal of a sample of breast tissue for examination. It helps in determining the presence of cancer or other breast abnormalities. Breast biopsy. Fancy learning English like a pro and testing your advanced English skills? Well, head over to the community tab on my page and test yourself in the Learning English Pro Advanced English Quiz. Every day you can test your English vocabulary knowledge with a tricky question. And in the community tab, you'll also see lots of additional Learning English Pro learning content. Cystoscopy is a procedure that involves using a thin tube with a camera to examine the interior of the bladder and urethra. It aids in diagnosing and treating various urinary tract conditions. Repeat after me. Cystoscopy. Bronchoscopy is a diagnostic procedure that allows the visualization of the airways and lungs using a thin, flexible tube with a light and camera. It is used to detect and treat respiratory conditions. Bronchoscopy. Our next surgical term is probably the longest word I've ever encountered doing Learning English Pro videos but if you break it down bit by bit, it's actually quite easy to say. 
Let's try it slowly first. Esophago gastro duodenoscopy. Let's do it one more time. Esophago gastro duodenoscopy. It can also be shortened to EGD, which is probably a better way to go about it. EGD is a procedure that involves the insertion of a flexible tube into the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. It is commonly used to diagnose and treat conditions affecting the upper gastrointestinal tract. So let's try that big long word one more time. Esophago-gastro-duodenoscopy. A radical mastectomy is an extensive surgical procedure for breast cancer involving the removal of the entire breast, underlying chest muscles and lymph nodes. Modern approaches often favor less invasive techniques when appropriate. Radical mastectomy. A vasectomy is a surgical procedure for male sterilization involving the cutting or sealing of the tubes that carry sperm from the testicles. This results in the prevention of sperm from reaching semen, making a man unable to father children. Vasectomies are a safe and effective method of permanent contraception and are done as an outpatient procedure. Vasectomy. And that wraps up our English masterclass on medical terms and phrases. Well done if you stuck out through the entire video. You've learned a tremendous amount of medical English by watching this video. Make sure to share it with friends and colleagues who might benefit from watching these lessons. And don't forget to subscribe to Learning English Pro. I publish new medical English lessons all the time. On screen, you'll see a link for a playlist for more medical English. And there's also a link for my video on hospital vocabulary. It's really useful. Thank you so much for joining me for this masterclass. Part two will be coming very, very soon. Have a fantastic day and remember, keep learning English like a pro.